Well, now we're going to get into the meat of inferential statistics. We're going to be talking about hypotheses and actually testing the hypothesis, in this case with this lesson, just a one sample. So the idea here is we're going to make a statement and then we're going to try to prove it through sampling data. A hypothesis is a statement about a population parameter. Remember, a parameter is just what we refer to statistics that are based on populations. And so in this case, let's assume that it is assumed that the average age of a student at this college is 22.5. But my hypothesis, my guess, is that it's more than that. I think the students are getting older. And so that would be my hypothesis, is that the students at this college are greater than 22.5. Now hypothesis testing is going to be the procedure in which I take a sample and then I analyze or test the result of the sample that I've taken to see whether or not my hypothesis can be accepted or rejected. Now the hypothesis testing procedure actually has five steps and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because this is incredibly important. So the first step is to state the null and alternate hypothesis. Now we'll explain this as we go but quite simply the null hypothesis is what's assumed to be true. The alternate hypothesis is what you're trying to prove or what you are asserting. Then you're going to select a level of significance. Uh, that level of significance we'll explain in detail but it, it, it's sort of related to the confidence interval in that uh, we could almost say in layman's terms we want to be 90% or 95% sure or confident, but we'll explain it more in detail. Then we're going to identify the test statistic. It might be the T, it might be the Z, or a couple of others that we're going to learn about. Then we're going to formulate our decision rule, which is going to be a critical Z or T value, which we'll look up in the table. Then we're going to go ahead and compute a Z or a T or an F or a chi-square, and then we'll decide whether or not we're going to reject our null hypothesis or accept it and assume that the status quo is still in place. All right, we're going to be working with two hypotheses, the null and the alternate. The alternate, quite simply, is what I'm trying to prove, what I'm setting out to prove, or what my assumption is. The null is essentially the opposite, and it's assumed to be true, or it, it's assumed to be the status quo. In other words, nothing's changing, this is the way it is, this is the way it's going to be. Nothing has changed. The alternate, on the other hand, is, yeah, things are changing. Well, here's some important things that we need to understand about uh, the null and the alternate hypothesis. First off, h sub 0 is how we designate the null hypothesis, and h sub 1 is how we designate the alternate. These two together are mutually exclusive. In other words, one uh, does not affect the ability to get the other, and together they include all the possibilities. So we're either greater than 22.5 or we're not greater than 22.5. We always assume that h sub 0, the null hypothesis, is true. The alternate is what we're having the burden of proof on, what we're actually testing to see if that could be the case. We use a random sample, and then we either reject the null or we do not reject the null. And in theory, if that we are rejecting the null, we can kind of assume that perhaps the alternate is correct, but we really don't ever accept the alternate. We just either reject the null or do not reject the null. We typically use equality as part of the h sub 0, or the null hypothesis, such as equal to, greater than, or equal to, less than, or equal to, whereas not equal to, less than, or greater than are usually how we designate what we're looking for in the alternate hypothesis. You might recall, in a couple of slides ago, we introduced you to the five-step process of hypothesis testing, and the second step was to select the level of significance, and I said it was you know, roughly e equivalent to a confidence interval confidence level. It's actually a little bit different and um, what we're really talking about with a significance level is a type 1 error. So the type 1 error is defined as the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis when it's actually true. We denote that with alpha and we refer to that as our, as our level of significance. The type 2 error is kind of the opposite. And that is failing to reject a null hypothesis when it's actually false and we designate that with the Greek letter beta. The third step, after we've selected the level of significance, whether it's going to be you know, 0.01 or 0.1, 0.05, which again roughly equates to uh, we want a 1% chance of uh, making a mistake or a uh, half a percent or 5%, then we're going to come up with a test statistic. And at this point, we've talked a little bit about T and Z, but by the time we're done with this course, you'll learn about the F and also the chi-square. So the test statistic is which one of these we're going to work with. The critical value is going to be the T or the Z that corresponds to the level of significance that we're looking for. We're then going to compare the critical value to the value that we actually compute. So to make a long story short, if we're looking for a level of significance of 0.05, 
and it's a two-tail test, and we'll explain that here in just a second, that would mean that we're going to end up with a z-value of approximately 1.96. So if our z value that we compute is greater than that or less than that, that helps us determine whether we're going to reject or not reject the null hypothesis. So the critical value is what we compare the test statistic that we compute to. And this will make more sense as we continue on. Well, here we see uh, an illustration of a normal distribution helping us to understand the difference between one tail and two tail. With a two tail test, that means we're looking for two directions. And so an example of this would be, I assume the null hypothesis is that the average age of a student at this college is 22.5. And with a two tail test using that example, the alternate would be is that it's not 22.5, which means it could be either less than or greater than, going in two different directions. When we're doing a one-tail test, we're just looking at one direction. So in this instance where we have a one-tail left test, or left-tail test up at the top here, uh, we would assume in this case that the average age of the student at this college is less than 22.5. On the other hand, the null hypothesis would be it is greater than or equal to 22.5. And with a final example, a right-tail test, in this case my alternate hypothesis was it would be that the average age is more than 22.5 the null hypothesis would be that it is less than or equal to 22.5 as I mentioned before um, the status quo or what is assumed to be the case or assumed to be true is the null hypothesis the claim that you're trying to prove is the alternate now if you look at this little chart it'll kind of help you translate English words into mathematical symbols so for instance larger or more than would be greater than smaller of course or less is less than no more than is less than or equal to at least greater than or equal to has increased greater than is, a, is different or is there a difference not equal to has not changed equal to and so on and so forth so remember what we're trying to prove the, the boastful claim as this slide says is our alternate what's assumed to be true the status quo no change is the null hypothesis all right let's see if we can put this all together with an example so in this case we have a steel company that manufactures desks and it follows a normal probability distribution. Remember, that is one of the assumptions that we always make. And we know in this case that the population mean is 200, and the population standard deviation is 16. So they've tried a new production method, and they want to see in this case, is there a change? In other words, is it not equal to 200 anymore? So let's go ahead and go through these steps and see how this will actually work doing our hypothesis test. So here we have it broken down in the steps. So the null hypothesis, what's assumed to be true, assuming that nothing has changed, is that the mean is still 200. The alternate, what we're trying to prove, is that it's not. We don't know if it's larger or smaller. We change the production uh, process. We just want to see if it's larger or smaller. We think it might be, but we're assuming it's still 200. The level of significance that the case gave us was 0.01. So in this case, we only want a 1% chance of making a mistake. And we're going to use the Z test statistic because we know the population standard deviation. That's how we know we use a Z if we have the population standard deviation. All right, our next step is to formulate the decision rule, and what that means is find the critical value. Now, we're, we know we're using the Z statistic. We also know the level of significance is 0.01. That means our do not reject area, as we see in this little um, illustration on the slide here, is 99% of the distribution. Because it's a two-tailed test, which, which remember we're just wanting to see has it changed not is it larger or smaller but has it changed that means we have a half of a percent on either side so with the probability that we're looking for in the table is 0.495 and you kind of see that there in the blue uh, in the duplication of the uh, z table there and we end up with a 2.576 z so our critical value is 2.576 all right, we've looked up a critical value of 2.576 on the Z table because we want one half of a percent on each tail and each side. The next step is to actually compute the Z from our values. And this is the formula that we used. You've seen this before, but uh, the Z would be the X bar, the sample mean minus the mu, the population mean, divided by the population of the standard deviation, which we have to have if we're going to do a Z divided by the square root of n. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and see how these numbers come out.
All right, so now we're going to make the decision based on the z that we computed and our critical value. So if you first look at the normal distribution there, you'll see that we have the two reject areas. And what we're talking about when we reject, we're rejecting the null hypothesis. So quite simply, if the z that we compute is more negative than 2.576 or more positive than positive 2.576, then it is in the rejection area. But if it falls between there, which means it's you know not as high or, or not as small, and we actually computed a z of 1.55 or 1.547 as uh, shown on the other slide there, and you can see where that falls. It isn't larger than 2.576, so it is within the do not reject area. So basically what that means is we cannot say with a 0.01 level of significance that the mean has changed. Yeah, we have 203, but it's not statistically significant at the 0.01 significance level. Maybe it's changed, maybe it isn't, but we have not proven that statistically. So we would not reject the null hypothesis. We would conclude that maybe this is just a, you know, a bad sample, but it's not statistically significant enough to say that the production procedure has changed and that the mean is higher or lower in this case. When we're doing a one sample test of hypothesis and we know the population standard deviation, we use the z. However, in many cases we're not going to know the population standard deviation and in that case we're going to use the t. Now the t will use a standard deviation but it'll use the standard deviation of the sample. So if you look at this slide you'll actually see the formula for computing a t. It's, it's exactly the same as computing the z with the exception of we use s, the standard deviation of the sample, as opposed to sigma, the standard deviation of the population. Well, let's go through an example using the T statistic for hypothesis testing. So with this example, the insurance company uh, reports that the mean cost, they're assuming the population mean is 60 to process a claim. So they've done a survey, they've done a sample of 26 claims, and uh, they've came up with the information, the numbers that you see below. And so what we'd like to know at the 0.01 significance level, is it reasonable to claim that the processing cost has changed from 60? Is it less than 60 in this case? So our null hypothesis is that it's not less than 60. Our alternate hypothesis is that it is less than 60. Now let's review one concept that's very important. We talked about confidence levels and confidence intervals. And with a confidence level, that's the proportion that the estimate will be correct. And if we have a confidence level of 95%, then 95 out of 100 times the sample will represent the population values. The significance level, on the other hand, is how frequently the hypothesis decision will be wrong. And that will make a type 1 error. And uh, we'll go ahead and explain what a type 1 error is again in the next slide. So we define a type 1 error as the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. Remember the null hypothesis is the status quo or what's assumed to be true when it's actually true. And we designate that with the Greek letter alpha and it's known as the significance level. So if our significance level is 0.01, that means that our chances of rejecting a null hypothesis when it's actually true is only 1%, 1 out of 100. All right, so here we are back to the insurance claim example. So the null hypothesis is that it is greater than or equal to 60. It's not less than 60. The alternate hypothesis is that it is less than 60. The significance level that's been stated is 0.01. That means we only want a 1% chance of rejecting a null hypothesis when it's actually true. The test statistic will be the t because we do not know the population standard deviation. We're only going to be able to compute the sample standard deviation. All right, because we're using the t, we have to look up the uh, critical value in the t distribution. And remember, our degrees of freedom are n minus 1. There were 26 samples taken, and so the degrees of freedom is 25. And it's a one-tailed test because we're only looking in one direction less than. So we go to the one-tailed test in the 0.01 significance level with 25 degrees of freedom, and we end up with a critical value. That's the value that we're going to compare the t that we compute to to determine whether we reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. But that critical value comes out to be 2.485. At the bottom of the slide you also see the Excel command uh, that would do it as well for you. After we've looked up the critical value of the t that we're going to compare our statistic to, we go ahead and compute the test statistic. To compute the t, it's x bar minus mu divided by the standard deviation of the sample 
divided by the square root of n. And so when we compute that with this example, we end up with a negative 1.18. Now, if you look at the um, example there with the, dist the t distribution, you can see that the negative 1.8 is not more negative than the negative 2.485. So in this case, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. The further we get along in statistics, we will be talking more and more about the p-value. Well, the p-value is actually the probability of the t statistic or the z statistic that you actually computed. And we compare the p-value to our level of significance. So in the uh, other example, we had a z value of 1.55, and we were comparing that to a critical value of 2.33. The significance level that we were after was 0.01. However, the p-value associated with 1.55, which we'll show you here in just a second, is 0.0606 which is statistically significant, but it's not significant enough to meet the qualifications that we placed on it. But how we come up with a p-value uh, is we actually look up the p-value associated with the z or the t that we compute. And we'll show you that in the next slide here. All right, so the z-value that we computed with that example was 1.55. So we look up the probability in the z-table of 1.55. We end up with 0.4394. Now remember, we're always working with just half of the distribution. So we take 0.5 minus the 0.4394, and we end up with a p-value of a z-score of 1.55 of 0 0.0606. That's the probability of getting that particular z-score. Well, here's how you can interpret your p-value. If you have a p-value of 0.1, then we have some evidence that we might want to consider rejecting the null hypothesis. It is statistically significant. And remember that uh, the 0 0.10 is valid for statistics. However, if we have 0 0.05, then we have strong evidence that it's not true. 0 0.01, very strong evidence. And 0 0.001, very strong evidence. So we may also compute p-values when we end up with a t or a z that is actually larger than the critical value. So for instance, if we have set for ourselves a 0.05 significance level, we may compute a p-value of 0 0.001. And so we can conclude that, yeah, we have very, very extremely strong evidence that our alternate might be true or that the null hypothesis is not true. The final hypothesis test that we're going to be exploring in this particular lesson is a test concerning proportion. Remember, proportion is a percentage or a ratio of those that meet a certain category. Like, for instance, the number of people that pass the test divided by the entire class. So notice that in this case, we're using the pi to represent the population proportion. We're using p to represent the sample proportion, and n is the sample size. So the way we compute our z we still have to look up a critical value. We still go through the same five steps of hypothesis testing. The only thing that's different is the formula that we use to compute the z. So it is the sample proportion minus the population proportion divided by the square root of the population proportion times 1 minus the population proportion divided by the sample size. Once we have that z for the proportion, we com compare that to the critical value and then make the decision, do we reject or not reject the null hypothesis based on is the z we computed larger than our critical value.